Hey, good morning, church. Gosh, I have been so excited to start this journey through the book of Ezra. I think it's going to be so relevant to us in this particular time in in our lives, this strange year, this coronavirus season. So here's why I think that. Ezra basically tells the story of God's people who had been in exile for 70 years are now allowed to go back home and to begin rebuilding their lives. Now, Jerusalem had been thoroughly destroyed. And so as they start to rebuild their lives and even begin living kind of normally again, it never quite goes back to the way it was before. And it never quite gets to the level of expectation that they had had before they were allowed to go back home, which I think is a little bit like what we are experiencing and will experience as just this week we've gone through different levels another level of lockdown and it seems like things are going back to some kind of normal but it's just not going to be exactly like we had hoped or have become used to or even expect but I think what really caught my attention about the story of Ezra and how it relates to us is the timeline So it's not like all of a sudden God opened the doors for his people to go back home and just rush back home and set up, rebuilt their lives. The story of Ezra takes place over 80 years. So this book that we're going to study, 10 chapters, takes place over 80 years. That's after 70 years of waiting in exile. The process of going back home takes that long. 20 of those 80 years uh, recounts the building of the temple. And in that time, 10 of those years, nothing happened. It's like these, there's these gigantic pause moments in the story. In fact, before we even meet Ezra the scribe, there's a gap of almost 60 years uh, where the story of Esther takes place. And I think for me, one of the things that has characterized my personal experience during this lockdown time is just how warped the timelines are. It was was a three-week deal and then maybe a five-week and then it just got lengthened and and, and all along the way things are changing so fast. And for those who like rhythm and routine and some sense of knowing where we're going and what's happening when, it's been really difficult. And what we learn in the story of Ezra is in these topsy-turvy timelines, as God was stretching it out and there were these pause moments, God was doing something deliberate in that period of time. And that's what we want to learn. In this crazy period, what is God wanting to do with us? Because what Ezra shows us is God was shaping those people very specifically in that time. And he had deliberate purposes in the ways things unfolded. So what is God wanting to say to us? What is he wanting to do in our personal lives, in our families, as a church, and as people who live in his kingdom? That, that's, the, that's what I'm hoping to come out of this series. What is God trying to do? Because if once this is all over, and it will one day all be over, but if at that point nothing has changed in our lives for the better, then all that this coronavirus season has been is one massive nuisance that we survived. But I think there's so much more to it. This, I believe, is some kind of awakening. And God is doing something deliberate. And we want to know what he's doing so that when we get to rebuilding, we come back stronger. So you ready to get started? Let's read Ezra chapter 1. So Ezra chapter 1, I'm going to read just the first couple of verses. Verse 1 says this. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, 
The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns, be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. And then comes this list of all the people who decided to go back and start to rebuild the temple and all that they took with them. And then the last line says this, all these did Shesh Bazaar bring up when the exiles were brought up from Babylonia to Jerusalem. So there's two key lessons that we need to learn from just chapter one about how to come back stronger. And the first is this. We need to trust in the sometimes peculiar providence of God. Remember, this is God's doing. Just look at verse 1 again. In the first year of Cyrus, that the word of the Lord might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up Cyrus, king of Persia. Let me just set the scene for you. The kids ministry did a great job of describing this whole storyline. But just a a recap real quick. So the year 2000 BC, Abraham arrives on the scene and God tells Abraham, I'm going to build a nation out of your descendants. Fast forward, year 1500 BC, uh, around about, I'm I'm rounding it a little bit. Moses arrives to lead the Hebrew people out of Egypt. It's a tremendous, the 10 plagues, the crossing of the Red Sea, and then at Mount Sinai, they officially get formed into this nation of God. Fast forward to the year 1000, and now David is on the throne, uh, and he is really establishes this nation in the Promised Land. And after David comes Solomon, And the years of Solomon's rule of Israel are the glory years. Unparalleled wealth for the kingdom, territorial advancement, peace and fame. But towards the end of Solomon's life, things go a little bit wonky and 700 wives, 300 concubines and worshiping of other idols. And after Solomon comes his son, Rehoboam. And Rehoboam kind of messes everything up and there's a a rebellion in the land and the 10, 10 of the 12 tribes uh, remove themselves and they get a new king over them. And that is Jeroboam in the northern kingdom and Rehoboam, Solomon's son, ruling in the southern kingdom. And in the north, Jeroboam, I mean, he's just a guy, he just leads the people in idol worship and pretty much most of the kings that follow after Jeroboam do the same thing and God's judgment is upon them and his warnings and ultimately God's final judgment comes against the northern kingdom when in about the year 700 BC the Assyrians come and totally annihilate the northern kingdom like they are literally wiped out of historical record by the Assyrians that's the northern kingdom it's finished it's over Southern kingdom lasts a a little bit longer. There's some good kings, there's some bad kings. In fact, that Assyrian army, that same army, come against the southern kingdom. But at that time is the good king, Hezekiah, and he prays that amazing prayer you can read in Isaiah. And God just deals, he just wipes out the Assyrian army kind of overnight. So they get about 200 extra years, but there's still this cycle of idol worship. And God's final judgment comes against the southern kingdom in around about the year 500 BC, when now the Babylonians, the world's superpower at the time, under Nebuchadnezzar, besieged the city of Jerusalem. And they destroy the temple, and they take most of the people into exile. Well, they take all of the good 
people into exile and they leave behind in Jerusalem a poverty stricken remnant of people who are left to rebuild their lives amidst the smoldering ruins of the nation of Judah. And that happens around the year 500 BC. So if you're following the, the timeline, that's 1,000 years of their existence as a nation from the time they were constituted at Mount Sinai, now wiped out, finished, that's over. It's like the dream of the promised land has now, this space has become a land of broken promises. Or so it seems. See, God had promised to preserve his people. Despite his discipline and his judgment, he had promised to preserve them. And in particular, he had promised to preserve the line of Judah, the line of David. And so two of the great prophets who are prophesying at this time, Jeremiah and Isaiah, those two of the, two of the most well-known guys, both of them have prophecies about how God would preserve his people. It doesn't look like it, but he's going to preserve them and they will one day return back home. So here it is in the words of the prophet Jeremiah. So Jeremiah chapter 29. And I bet most of you listening today will know some of these verses. You've got it on the coffee mug sitting right next to you on a bumper sticker in your car on a magnet on your fridge. Right? Jeremiah 29 says this, For thus says the Lord, when the 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you. And I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for evil. To give you a future and a hope. And then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me. And find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Notice Jeremiah prophesies very specifically 70 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, God would allow them to come back. Guess how many years have elapsed since the destruction of Jerusalem and now the opportunity for the people of God to return back to Jerusalem? You guessed it, it is 70 years. In other words, the opening line of Ezra about God to fulfill the words by the prophet Jeremiah, God stirred up the heart of Cyrus. The opening line of Ezra tells us God fulfills his promises. And in particular, he fulfills his promise to preserve his people. Because I just feel like we need to pause on that and just reflect on that at times like this. God preserves his people, his promise to, and he fulfills those promises. Sometimes his fulfillment of those promises is through peculiar providence. Here's what you're not seeing in the story. Here's what's happening in the, in the nations of the world. When you see this, you'll see how sometimes God's providence is peculiar. So how did the mighty Babylonians fall? I mean, they ruled the world. And here comes this guy Cyrus, who, by the way, at the time is about age 20. He grew up in like the mountains of Iran. How did Cyrus and his kingdom destroy the mighty Babylonians? Well, after Nebuchadnezzar, 
great leader of the Babylonians. After he dies, there's a power struggle. His son takes the throne and he rebels against everything his father did. And he gets murdered by his brother-in-law. And a guy named Nabonidus takes the throne of Babylon and he decides to change the national religion of Babylon. They used to worship the god Marduk. And now he said, no, we're not going to worship the god Sin. That's the god's name. Like that should have been a heads up that that's probably not a good move. So he decides to change the national religion. So all the priests of Marduk rebel against Nabonidus and he just runs away, leaving Babylon pretty much unmanaged, ungoverned, like for years. And so now Cyrus, this young Persian king, is rising. His territory is expanding all the way to India and he literally just walks into Babylon. And as it turns out, Cyrus just happens to have a very different policy of how to rule over the kingdoms that he has uh, overtaken. Right, His policy is one of allowing those people that worship different gods. He wants to allow them to continue to worship their gods, which was unheard of as foreign policy in these times. So, for example, the Assyrians had a very different policy policy, the Assyrian policy of domination was to come in and obliterate, right? annihilate. So destroy, take all the people into exile, send your own Assyrian people to where those guys used to live, basically to breed them out of existence, which is what happened in the Northern Kingdom. So that nation no, no longer exists. And that's why uh, in Jesus' day, the Jews kind of hated the Samaritans who were just descendants of the Assyrians. That was the Assyrian policy, obliterate. The Babylonians were a little different. So they decided to kind of integrate. So they would take people into exile and then brainwash them, show them how much mightier Babylon was. And so that then they could rule through Babylonian policy, which is why the story of Daniel so important because Daniel maintained this sense of the identity as a person of God amidst this Babylonian policy of brainwashing. And here comes now Cyrus, very different, who's allowing them to worship whoever his idea is. If they're happy, then they will serve me better. Now you say, well, that's a fascinating history lesson. What does this mean? Well, what it means is that sometimes... God's providence, his means of fulfilling his promises is a little peculiar. I mean, who would have thought if you're watching world news? I mean, they couldn't watch world news at the time, but imagine they could and see, okay, and this guy never, there's been a power change in Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, who would have thought which Israelite living in Babylon, this is our moment. This is when we're going to go back. Nobody would have thought that. Who would have thought when Cyrus starts to rise to power that he would have this particular policy that would allow them to go back home? Here's the thing. When we look behind the scenes of human history, and I'm talking major international global events, when we look behind the scenes of human history, what we see is God is working and he's working to fulfill his promises to preserve his people even though sometimes that's happening in ways that we do not recognize so here's what i think i'm not not exactly sure how this is going to pan out for us in eternity one day but i really believe we're going to Enter into eternity, and at some point, we're going to get to see all that God was doing in our lives. Like, he'll just pull back and show, hey, here's what I was doing. And I'm convinced that we will be stunned, that there will be moments. We'll be like, oh, wait, that was you? You did that? I mean, even... The disappointments, the periods of waiting, the periods where it seemed like nothing good was happening. And we'll like zoom out and God will show us what he was doing and how that led to our ultimate good. And we go, God, that was you. 
at that time in my life, I can remember, I thought you were nowhere, but now I see that was you working behind the scenes of my history. And even the good things, like the great job offer that came my way, which I thought is because I was so brilliant. I go, no, that was you and all the circumstances that you brought to pass to make that happen. I mean, even if I just think of myself and standing here today, this is, I think, it was this weekend last year that I preached at Rosebank Union, at, at Rosebank Union Church. It became this journey to where I am today. It's still the only sermon I've actually preached in the church with a congregation, right? Like, just think about all the crazy circumstances that built up towards, we're, we've all got stories like that. When we pull back the curtains of human history and our stories, what we'll see is God's providence, sometimes in peculiar ways, at work. So I want to say, He really is at work right now. He is. We just don't always recognize it. So if you're in the devotion material uh, this past week, you'll see that often scholars refer to Ezra as the second exodus God letting his people go back to the promised land, which there's some similarities with the Exodus, but to be honest, it's actually very different. I mean, think about the Exodus from Egypt, these 10 plagues, Red Sea. It was very obvious that God was at work. You couldn't miss, this is God. I mean, unless you're Pharaoh, who was like, I'm, you, just could, you could tell this was God at work. Whereas, and I think in our lives, we've come to expect that. And when we cry out to God for help or we need deliverance, we come to expect that when it happens, it's going to happen in these spectacular ways. We'll know it's God. But Ezra tells us a very different Exodus story. It's a slow, topsy-turvy, it pauses, the timeline's all messed up, but it's still very much so. God's deliberate action in shaping his people, getting them ready to come back stronger. So if we are going to come back stronger, we need to trust in the providence of God. Sometimes it's peculiar. Number two, you need to hope in the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise. So let's change the subject here. Let's talk about Jesus for a little bit. So Jesus said all of scripture points to him. So where is Jesus in Ezra? Well, I'm really glad you asked. Here's something you need to know about how the books of Ezra and Nehemiah end. So spoiler alert, you should never do this. You should never, when you read a book, you don't go read the end, right? But I'm, I'm going to do exactly that right now. I'm going to tell you how Ezra and Nehemiah, and by the way, Nehemiah, same time period, same story, used to be one book. They both end spectacularly badly. Like worst ending to a story of a massive anticlimax in the ends of Ezra and, and Nehemiah. Let me give you an example from from Nehemiah. Nehemiah 13, so one of the last lines of the book of Nehemiah, verse 25, says this. So this is Nehemiah, who's just so desperately trying to get the people to renew, a spiritual renewal in the land. And he says this, And I confronted them. These are the guys aren't listening to him anymore. And I cursed them and beat some of them and pulled out their hair. I've read a ton of books on leadership from Nehemiah. I haven't read much about when people aren't listening to you, you should try shouting at them, beating them up and pulling out their hair, right? This is the end of Nehemiah. It's this tragic story. Ezra and Nehemiah so desperately pushing for revival, for spiritual renewal. And both of them just tragically end in disappointment. Why? Well, because you can't force transformation, renewal from the outside. That's what the Old 
covenant was doing is the system, the legal system was external obedience. That's what Ezra and Nehemiah were desperately trying to do. But it turns out you can't force change from the outside. There's got to be a, a new way, perhaps a new covenant, which is why at exactly this time, Jeremiah starts to speak about a new covenant. He says this, chapter 31, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will put my law within them. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Notice it's a very different covenant. It's not working from the outside in, it's working from the inside out. And interestingly, we see this new covenant idea, not just in Jeremiah who's prophesying this at this time. We see it in Ezra chapter 1. Where, you might ask? Well, If you've read through the whole chapter, you'll see the part I didn't read is this list of the people who who return and all that they brought back with them. It's a very detailed list of exactly how many silver basins and things that they brought back with them to Jerusalem. If you think, if you read through that, you might wonder, man, why is half of chapter one dedicated to an inventory of stuff they brought back home? I mean, like we get it, like they took everything and literally the kitchen sink with them. Why is there this detailed list? Of stuff. Well, you might remember that Nebuchadnezzar, when he destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, the center of their existence. But he took all of the artifacts of worship, took them with him and kept them. In fact, they pop up in the story of Daniel. And now in Ezra chapter 1, as these items are being listed, that they're taking them home and showing, oh, hey, this stuff that Nebuchadnezzar took, look, it's still here. We've got it. And we're taking it back home again with one noticeable exception. There is one item of worship, the most central item of worship that was taken by Nebuchadnezzar, but is not in this list of things they got to take back home. And what is that? Well, it's the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant? that box, the poles where the the tablets that God had given Moses on Mount Sinai were placed inside of. And this, this thing that represented the very presence of God. So whenever the Israelites went into battle, man, they took the Ark of the Covenant with them because it was the presence of God. When they took it, they won. And when they forgot to take it, they lost. So this is in the temple. Nebuchadnezzar comes, he destroys the temple, he takes the Ark of the Covenant. And to this day, the Ark of the Covenant has been erased from history. We don't know where it is. Why is that? Why has it suddenly disappeared? And Ezra's telling us, hey, it's not there. Well, because there is a new covenant that was being birthed at this time. Which is why then, 500 years later, again, around about Jesus on the night of the Passover at the last supper with his disciples he takes a cup and he says this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood he institutes this new covenant listen everything Nehemiah and Ezra were desperately striving for Everything Jeremiah and Isaiah were speaking about is now happening. But it takes place, it's fulfilled in a peculiar way through the death of Jesus. Well, it's not, it's not that peculiar if you know something about covenants, right? So the word covenant literally means to cut. And the idea is that when you make a promise, 
If it's a very weighty promise, then it's appropriate that there's a weighty sacrifice to help keep a sense of how solemn the promise is. So Abraham cuts you know, animals in half and is that, that when the covenant is made with God and Moses sprinkles blood on Mount Sinai and now Jesus' death and his blood signifies the weightiness of the promise of God to dwell with his people and to renew them from the inside that no matter where they are living, whether it is in desecrated Jerusalem, corrupt Babylon or anywhere in between, God's sense of renewal and rebuilding and hope and transformation is with them through Jesus. Now, I really want to help just just see how this can change our posture in this coronavirus season, this idea of promise and what it can mean for us. I mean, especially in a time when things are so unpredictable and everything's changing so drastically, so quickly. How does this help us today? Well, what I've come to learn is that we as human beings, we, one of the ways that we deal with unpredictability and change and the anxiety that comes from that is through prediction. So like, for example, like the weather. I don't know what's, you don't know what's going to happen with the weather and like how do we live not knowing how the weather's going to be. Well, we've become pretty good at predicting And that allows us to kind of navigate change and uncertainty, if we can predict it, and stock markets and all sorts of things. Prediction is one way that we navigate uncertainty and change. But what coronavirus has shown us, at the very least, is that prediction is a very fragile way to live. I mean, even, even if it you know, was predicted, even then it turns out that the most important things we either can't pay attention to and sometimes the most drastic change situations in our lives, whether it's tragic or good, are things that cannot be predicted. And I've, I've, I've experienced this in lockdown. It's, it's been, been trying to track and how it's happening in the rest of the world and, and realize it's so localized, you just coronavirus at the very least has shown us how fragile living by prediction is and prediction is based on control we cannot control so much the most important things around us we can't control but it turns out there's another way to deal with uncertainty and change it's completely different to prediction and it's the way of promise so imagine this, on my wedding day, around about eight years ago, I'm standing next to Kristen, and I say to her, I predict that today, or in 10 years' time, I will love you, and even if we're poor, like we're going to be poor, I'm still going to, I predict. Like, what kind of assurance does that give her? I mean, she has no idea of my history. And yet, the promise we made is a promise, get this, that is actually filled with uncertainty for better, for worse, for richer or poorer. In fact, the only thing certain in the promise that I made with her is that we will die one day. Everything is unpredictable. But I promise. See, promise is a far stronger, more reliable way to navigate uncertainty. That has helped me so much in this season. Knowing, hey, I I give up trying to figure out when, how, what is going to happen. At the end of the day, you don't need to know those things if you trust in the promises of God to preserve and to dwell with you no matter how things are going around you. Let's pray. God, as we gather before you this morning, with yes, so much changing, so drastically and so quickly around us, and with a sense that we're coming back 
But what we're coming back to is a very different kind of world and life than what we used to or what we expect. God, I pray that this morning that your promise to preserve us and not just to preserve us, but enable us to rebuild, to be renewed, to flourish. Even in a Babylon world <laughs> is sure and true. And we know it because of you, Lord Jesus, the ultimate fulfillment of the promise of scripture, of the promise of history. And so God, would that anchor us today and already start to take shape in us, to form us into a people who come back stronger. And we pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.